Hey, everyone. Welcome back to The Jacobin Show. I'm Jen Pan, and I'm here with Paul Prescott. Paul, what's happening? Not much. I'm, uh, I'm actually on spring break now, the Philly Hell Public School yeah. spring break. So, um, but yeah, I'm excited for the show tonight. Um, if people don't know, we have Mark Dudzik coming on. He was a central organizer in the Labor Party in the 1990s and uh, early 2000s. We also have Richard Hooker. I know he's a crowd favorite. He is coming on towards the end of the show to talk about um, an action he did. And uh, I worked with him on in, in Philly recently targeting UPS. So that should be fun. Um, just really quickly before we start. So what's going on with UPS? Yeah. So, um, you know, I mean, what's not going on with UPS? But the, <laughs> the biggest thing they've been fighting on lately was around um, worker health and safety. And, um, you know, they, especially this one specific member of the union, you know, um, had an injury and they, the company basically did not want to let her, let her see her doctor, you know, made her wait for a long time before getting any care. So um, we put together a, a rally basically pressuring them you know, to, to make sure workers were uh, respected on the job regarding health and safety. Cool. So Rich is going to have updates on that. Yep. So um, obviously tonight's theme is the labor the party. party episode. The part It's the party episode, yeah. party in the USA. Um, <laughs> and the, the question of third parties in general. Um, so, so I have a question for you, Paul, um, and it's a little bit loaded for you because you live in a swing state. Have you ever voted for a third party in a presidential election or otherwise? I actually haven't. I have not. There has been a year I did not vote. Mm. That, well, I'll say it was 2012. I did not <laughs> vote. Um, but I have not voted third party. Uh, not not for president, not for governor, not for any right. state office. Not for anything. You're st you're a straight Republican <laughs> ticket yeah, voter, right, right? right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, so as someone who you know has honestly never lived in a swing state, um, I've mentioned on this show before that I grew up in Idaho, which is a very deep red state. Um, and then since then, I've lived in pretty deep blue states. Um, so so I have cast many a ballot for <laughs> a third party in my lifetime uh, without guilt. Um, and I do want to say, you know, when I was living in Idaho, um, this is obviously when I'm growing up. Um, and, and I was not able to vote. I was such a fan of Ralph Nader that I convinced my parents or at least my mom at the time to vote for Ralph Nader in at least one presidential election. And I also wanna mention that I was involved with a chapter of the local Green Party. Um, oh, okay. and, and yeah, and, and <clears throat> what we did was, you know, in a state like Idaho, we A, protested the war, B, I spent a lot of time standing outside the Boise Food Co-op gathering signatures to get the Green Party on the ballot. Um, and I mentioned that last point because something I remember very vividly when I was doing that, um, even though you know this is years ago, is that lots of people who would pass, who I would engage, uh, trying to get them to sign to get the Green Party on the ballot would say, I don't want the Green Party on the ballot you ruined the 2000 election. And that was, of course, uh, Bush versus Gore, uh, where, where Ralph Nader was running as a Green Party candidate. And so I, I wanted to just kick off by talking about um, third parties, or the, the spoiler effect, I guess, mm -hmm. because this is something that we hear all the time when it comes to third parties. This is like the perpetual um, thorn in the side of liberals, right? Like, Every time there's a presidential election, we hear about Nader and how he, you know, ruined the 2000 election and indirectly, I guess, because of that, like caused the Iraq war, uh, you right. know, caused years of Bush's destruction. Uh, Nader did this now. Um, and then, of course, in 2016, we heard the same types of arguments repeated about um, Jill Stein. So um, I don't know. Do you do you think that third parties really do play a kind of major spoiler effect? No, I mean, I think, you know, people are kind of assuming the Green Party is more powerful than it is. I mean, right. maybe I wish they were that powerful to do that. You know, they don't. But I think, you know, what's complicated here, I mean, I do understand the fear and mm -hmm. um, about that. And because, you know, the thing as much as lesser evil voting and that situation frustrates us, like it's a thing because there is a really is a lesser evil. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think I used to say this all the time during the 2020 election campaign. I probably said it on the show, but, you know, I, I was convinced to vote for Biden just on the NLRB alone. And that's what I, I would tell people. And it would sound a little crazy for me to say, well, they're just the same Democrat, Republican. Right. There's no difference. Um, now, another example of my state that the governor, uh, we now have a Democratic governor. But um, before that, there was a Republican Long story short, he passed what we called the doomsday budget, um, just like 
terrible austerity budget. And, you know, this governor has restored some of it, has put forward actually a budget that's pretty good. You know, so it's like if I'm talking to a coworker, it would kind of sound insane for me to say, oh, well, there's no difference. It doesn't matter. Right. You know, so that's what makes this a very complicated issue. Right. I do want to share. Um, so just last year during the 2020 election, um, there was a piece in the nation um, excoriating a fellow that we, we, are, we are slightly familiar with. So if we can pull up that headline here. What the fuck is Jackson's <laughs> editor thinking in voting green? <laughs> wow, it's coming out of my boss. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, so what happened was Bhaskar, who we of course all, all know and love, um, he had tweeted this. Uh, he 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 said he was going to vote for Howie Hawkins, who was running on the Green Party ticket. Then he went on to say, "But I'm not a believer in building the Green Party. No matter what your individual choices in November, the political act is to organize on issues like Medicare for all, uh, building organizations, and back down ballot candidates supporting the Bernie agenda." Uh, so I think that is you know completely and totally fair. Um, and I think that, uh, as I think you had sort of alluded to, there is kind of a tendency sometimes on the left, I think, to romanticize third parties a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I say that as somebody who just admitted to being like completely, you know, enamored of Nader. By the way, if anybody knows Ralph Nader, tell him he's welcome on the show anytime. Just want to put that out yeah, there. Apparently, that's <laughs> a thing in the comments that we won't let him on. I don't know. Brilliant. Someone, yeah, someone was like, Ralph Nader wants to come on the show. And if that were actually true, like he's welcome on the show. So just, right. just putting that out there. <laughs> um, but I, I, I do want to say, you know, as much as we love Ralph Nader, or I won't speak for you, Paul, as much as I love Ralph oh, Nader, yeah. there, there are some issues with the Green Party strategy that I think it's worth getting into here. And for me, you know, I, I like, I, I just admitted that, you know, I kind of cut my teeth working with the Green Party. Um, but that said, the biggest obstacle to me uh, when it comes to the Green Party is they really function as as a protest party, right? Like they pop up every four years to, you know, be in the election and to criticize the Democrats. Um, but as far as I can tell, they don't really engage in substantive base building outside of the outside of the election cycle. And I'm not saying that that's every person in the Green Party or like everybody who votes Green. Like I'm sure like plenty of those people are involved in other institutions. Um, but the Green Party as a party, um, again, from what I can tell, doesn't engage in that kind of organizing. Yeah. and. What's tough here as well is that, you know, also I think they started in a different moment, you know, like, uh, you know, pre Bernie, the wilderness or the left was in the wilderness is with a different terrain. Um, but also what's tough is that, you know, even if we can say the Democrats are getting worse and worse and more pathetic, the Republicans are also getting literally more crazy and scary. And so, yep. again, I think if anything, um, We'll see what happens after Trump or if there's new figures that emerge in the Republican Party. But I think Trump made the lesser evil sell even better, mm -hmm. um, you know, or even more important, the the fact that you, you're you going to have to vote Democrat um, and all these other people who are coming up in the party that just seems so just batshit crazy. Like, I, unfortunately, it's strengthening the idea of you have to vote lesser evil. And I'm only mm -hmm. just naming that as a dilemma, it's not an excuse for not criticizing Democrats or trying to build something new, but I think it's a dilemma we really have to have to live with. Mm -hmm. Right. And obviously voting third party, whether that's green or, you know, whatever, um, um, isn't going to do anything to alleviate that problem. Um, right. So I, I want to just quickly bring up a quote uh, from Adolf Reed from Jacobin, uh, because I think this gets at something that we want to ask Mark Dudzik about in a little bit. So he writes, a new politics must start from the understanding that the Democrats are ultimately unreformable and that a party of our own remains the greatest unresolved challenge of the U.S. working class. But proclaiming this reality does not make it so. Then he goes on to say, working class parties are not built by constructing a shopping list of progressive proposals or assembling a letterhead of prestigious left leaders and organizations. They are built by engaging in the nitty gritty of building a constituency and giving voice to their needs and concerns. Um, and I, I think, I mean, like, I can't think of a better way to phrase that. Um, and I think that that really gets at the heart of what has been a major stumbling block for a lot of third parties um, and is actually something that the Labor Party, um, which, again, we'll hear about in a little bit, tried to overcome by working from a different model. Um, but right. to me, you know, that, you know, that the, the shopping list of progressive ideals and like, uh, you know, headed uh, letterhead of prestigious leaders, like, 
that sounds so familiar because that is the model that so many uh, sort of uh, organizations or people disillusioned with the Democrats have defaulted to. Yeah, and, and it really gets to this idea that like, well, we just build it, and it meaning not a constituency, but something called a party that has a platform, you know, people will come and it's mm -hmm. like, oh, I mean, our, our program looks great. Who would disagree with it? People are just going to flock to it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, and it just like, it just doesn't, doesn't work work that way ever. Um, and so people mistake that. Uh, I think especially now with, um, you know, social media, it's very easy to feel like the 40,000 people that liked AOC's tweet, they are now the constituency for a labor party. And again, right. it just doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that's something that we talk about on this show sort of over and over directly and indirectly is the question of like, what is a consist constituency, right? Um, right. Uh, to bring up Adolf Reed again, like he has the kind of classic line that a constituency um, is a, a group of people with actual names and addresses. And that sounds so basic and obvious. But I think a lot of times, like, like you say, when it comes to social media, or even when it comes to a lot of progressive nonprofits, they don't actually have that. Or or politicians for that matter, right? Yeah. Like the, cl the classic example is when um, the Black Lives Matter activist, DeRay McKesson, like ran for, for uh -huh. office in Baltimore and got less than 1% of the vote, despite, as you were saying, like this massive social media presence. Um, uh, so, so again, this question of what is a constituency and what is not, I think is really important. Right, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought up DeRay because so I didn't have to, um, but yeah, I mean, it really is. Cause like he, he really had this moment of like, wow, he's a leader. Mm -hmm. you look at him. He's always on CNN. You wouldn't think that he could only get 1% of the vote. But mm -hmm. again, that just shows you the difference. Yeah. I also want to mention, you know, very briefly that um, I think a lot of liberals and even leftists often make the mistake of conflating constituency with racial identity. Right. So you right. hear a lot of people talking about like the black vote or the Latino vote or what have, or even the, the white working class vote, um, whatever mm -hmm. that means. And um, I think it's, it's very misleading. And I think it leads, I think that's it, precisely the thing that leads people to an understanding of representation that is somebody who looks like me, right? Like we hear this all the time now. Like I, I like, like we, we need to get more women and people of color represented in the Biden administration. And that just means getting more women and people of color, like in the Biden administration. But right. how is that actually representing a constituency in the most classic sense of the word? It isn't. Right. And even that would extend, you know, to there's a new labor caucus in Congress. And right. part of their thing is like, you know, we want more working class people, union members to run, which I'm 100 percent for. But even in that situation, you know, I don't think it could be assumed that, oh, if there are more working class people in Congress, mm -hmm. therefore, it, it immediately follows that we're going to get better pro worker policy. I mean, I think right. I would bet on that it would in most cases. And I'm certainly want more working class people in Congress. But, you know, you have plenty of working class people that become managers that become wealthier than managers, you know, like it's not a automatic given mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. because of their identity. Right. Um, and actually, I think that is the perfect segue yeah. into um, something that you wanted to talk about. So take it away. Yeah. Um, I know usually I try to play good cop and come with the um, good news when I do my segment. Um, unfortunately, this is not as good news, but I think it's a very interesting thing to look at. Um, so, you know, the, the news cycle is finally off of constantly dissecting and reanalyzing the results of the 2020 presidential election. But those results are still reverberating and influencing the direction of party politics. For the left, one of the biggest questions the 2020 election raised is which party is the party of the working class? Are we watching a realignment in real time of workers finding a permanent home in the Republican Party? And if this is true, how do we stop it? By now, we know that Biden was carried to victory by a huge shift of affluent suburbanites to the Democratic Party. Trump still won 40 percent of union households in the 2020 election. And now we're seeing some political fig figures openly flirting with the idea of making the Republicans the party of the multiracial working class, in the words of Marco Rubio. And uh, little Marco also shed light on these contradictions by penning a very weird op-ed showing tepid support for Amazon workers in their union drive. So how do we make sense of all this? What could this mean for keeping working class people from drifting to the right, let alone building an independent labor party? Though Trump's approach to workers and unions may have seemed different and innovative, it really wasn't. Whether consciously or not, Trump operated from a similar playbook to Richard Nixon. 
Both Nixon and Trump understood the importance of appealing to a blue collar working class base, and both saw the opportunity to disorient the Democratic New Deal coalition by doing so. Except Nixon was much more sophisticated in his strategy of breaking away working class people, especially union members from the Democratic Party. If there was one moment or one event that seemed to highlight the opportunities Nixon saw for this, it was the hard hat riot in May of 1970. Four days after Kent State, a massive demonstration in lower Manhattan set off legions of hard hats whose rage had been building for years. It was never planned to explode, but it did explode. Well, I was on Water Street and we all just headed towards uh, Broadway and uh, all you could hear was just shouting in, in senses of let's get the bastards and, and let's finish this once and for all. And there was some blood spilt. But it was all in anger, all in vengeance. Let's get them. And, and a lot of people, including myself, was was releasing the the hate and and the feelings that you had. Of course, a lot of us felt the uh, winners. We felt very proud. Uh, we scattered the enemy. The hard hats were heroes for a few days, praised by Wall Street workers, given free coffee by area luncheonette owners. Now, there are a lot of details about this event that are often overlooked, like the fact that many workers were paid to leave their shift, and polls afterwards showed that a majority of building trades workers actually disapproved of that violence. But for many people, this solidified in their minds the image of the white working class as hopelessly conservative. For Nixon, this was a golden opportunity to push forward a strategy that he had been dreaming about. And this dream started by observing the kind of support George Wallace was able to get during the 1968 election. Um, Wallace was a segregationist governor of Alabama and fused populist rhetoric with racist sentiments. Though he didn't win the nomination, he was able to get a significant amount of support from Northern white workers. Nixon's advisor, Kevin Phillips, believed a major ethnic realignment was happening. In his book, The, Emergency, the, uh, the Emerging Republican Majority, Phillips argued that a moderate conservatism could win over workers that eventually voted for Democratic candidate Hubert Humphrey, but were very sympathetic to Wallace. Liberals obsess about this issue as well. Liberal journal, journalist Pete Hamill wrote an article for the New York Magazine called The Revolt of the White Lower Middle Classes that Caught Nixon's Eye. In it, Hamill argued that the support Wallace got in the North was less about race per se and more about the idea that workers were not respected. Other louder voices in society were getting the attention and resources. And Hamill warned that it was important for politicians to begin to deal with the growing alienation and paranoia of the working class white man. Any politician who leaves that white man out of the political question does so at a very large risk. Nixon sought out to make a cultural appeal to workers, turning their angle towards the liberal cultural elite and not the economic elite. Even though he didn't want to pursue pro-working class economic policies, he did recognize that it would be hard to appeal to them if he openly attacked the trade union movement. And what followed from this perspective was an incredibly sophisticated strategy towards the labor movement. This is the context in which the hard hat riot happened, and Nixon moved quickly to capitalize on this political opening. On May 20th, 1970, about uh, nine days after the, the riot, the Building and, and Construction Trades Council of New Greater New York sponsored a rally of 100,000 people in support of the war. Let's take a look at, at a clip of how one of the few voices of opposition at this rally was received. Are you a construction worker? I'm an apprentice with the iron workers. Iron workers, local six. Apparently, you don't agree with the purpose of this demonstration. No, I don't. I don't support President Nixon, and I don't support the war. Do you anticipate any trouble here today? No, I don't think so. Do you I think American forces should be withdrawn from Vietnam? Yes, I do. I don't think we should have ever been there in the first place. 
I'm against Nixon. I'm against just about everything he stands for. I think that I have two brothers. He's not speaking for the construction workers. He's all, he's, he's all by himself. I'm what do the construction workers say? We say that we support our flag. We support our government. We support what they're doing over there. We're supporting our working men, and we're not back of this guy at all. He's one of them, but he has his way. He's an individual. Let me tell you something. He's down here with that sign, not here representing us construction people. We represent that flag. I stood down here in the last week demonstration. They were tearing it down and bringing it up back and forth on that pole. That flag didn't know which way to go, and we're for that flag, and not what he stands for. He has nothing to do with this, and I wish that the cameras wouldn't be on this guy. He's nothing. That thing shouldn't even be here. That thing shouldn't even be here. Now, many blue-collar workers were not necessarily especially pro-war, but they resented what they considered the approach and privilege of the protesters. College students had a draft deferment, something that was not available to most working-class kids. Peter Brennan, the head of the New York Building Trades, articulated the appeal Nixon had with his members, saying, what is winning their political loyalty is their admiration for your masculinity. The image of being strong, forceful, and decisive will have a powerful personal appeal with the alienated voter. Nixon followed this up by meeting with 22 New York Union officials at the White House who presented him with a hard hat labeled commander in chief. Then in the summer of 1970, Nixon invited AFL-CIO President George Meany and 60 other labor leaders to the White House on Labor Day. The administration decided to try and pick off labor leaders one by one for support. Nixon's aide, uh, Chuck Colson, suggested an array of tactics like appointing labor representatives to every commission, having an administration official at every labor convention and fixing possible indictments of friend, friendly labor leaders. But the administration had to balance the courting of union leaders with their main economic priority of fighting inflation. Nixon's treasury secretary, Charles Walker, circulated a memo saying that there was no way to fight inflation without reducing the power of some major unions. Nixon made this turn in early 1971 when he suspended the Davis-Bacon Act, which is a law that requires prevailing wage levels for federally supported construction projects. They quickly put it back in place, however, when they feared a big backlash from labor. But then later in the year, they instituted a 90-day wage freeze, which angered AFL-CIO President George Meany. This turned the labor officialdom against Nixon because there was a limit to how far their support could go without actual material gains in return. But this did not stop Nixon from trying to make cultural appeals to working class people. And incredibly, he intervened in the Republican platform committee to make sure no overt attacks on labor were included. The culture war was a central part of his 1972 presidential campaign against Democratic nominee George McGovern. Nixon outlined the strategy in one of his scribbled memos saying, we should increasingly portray McGovern as the pet radical of Eastern liberalism, the darling of the New York Times, the hero, hero of the Berkeley Hill jet set, Mr. Radical Chic, by November, he should be postured as the establishment's fair-haired boy, and Nixon postured as a candidate of the common man, the working man. In the end, the 1972 election represented a big step towards breaking working class voters away from the Democratic Party. Despite his tense relationship with the AFL-CIO leadership, he won 50% of the manual worker vote and 54% of the union vote. Whether they continued to support Republicans did not matter as much as the fact that they were alienated from politics and no longer voting Democrat. With a more demobilized working class, the ruling class found it much easier to carry out its agenda. So now let's fast forward to Donald Trump. Trump was not nearly as smart, sophisticated, or hardworking as Nixon, but he was able to effectively appeal to some sections of the working class in a way Democrats haven't been able to in a long time. And like Nixon, Trump used the building trades as a symbol of the working class his campaign represented. Let's look at Trump bantering with the North American Building Trades Union shortly after winning the presidency in 2017. And I promise you that America's labor leaders will always find an open door with Donald Trump. Always. Just look at the amazing talent assembled here. We have iron workers, insulators. <laughs> Never changes, does it, with the iron workers? Well, let's hear it. Laborers. 
painters, fitters, plumbers, operators. They're operators, all right, I'll tell you that. Electricians. Not that good. Where's my local three? Oh, where's local three? That wasn't that good. Electricians. Well, they became so rich, they don't have to. Let's do that again. Electricians. Oh, that's better. Bricklayers. Boiler makers. Elevator constructors. Good job. Sheet metal workers. Roofers. Plasters. Plaster? Well, yeah, that's... We're not using as much plaster as we used to, fellas, right? No matter how you cut it. I'm sorry about that. I'm not sure I can do much. We brought back the coal miners. I'm not so sure about the plasters. We'll do the best we can, okay? We're going to do the best we can. How about the cement masons? And, of course, our wonderful Teamsters. Well, that wasn't very good, James. Huh? <laughs> but really, you're the backbone of America. With the talent in this room, we can build any city at any time, and we can build it better than anyone. So thankfully, Trump was not able to fully consolidate his power and win re-election. But the experience of Nixon and Trump just show us that there is no God-given law that keeps working class people or even labor unions tied to the Democratic Party. Especially in a time of crisis, there is vast potential for political and social realignments. If the situation keeps getting more desperate, there is no telling what a more skilled political figure on the right could do to mold a more permanent constituency of workers loyal to the right wing. And um, Jen, let me ask you a question. Do you think um, Pete Buttigieg could name all those trades? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I really like that segment where <laughs> where Donald Trump is just listing every type of right. blue collar occupation he can think of. Um, but I, you know, I really don't think that Pete Buttigieg would be would would right. would be quite as as you know quick with that list. I mean, we saw him on the picket line, uh, kind of awkwardly bantering with people on strike. Do you remember this? I actually didn't see that video. Oh, I would okay. Love to. Yeah, I should have. I, I should have gotten that video clip. Yeah. But anyway, um, for anybody who's watching, go go Google Pete Buttigieg on the picket line, and you will have a good laugh. <laughs> yeah, um, and, you know, another thing that's amazing is that, and I didn't, you know, put this in the segment, but I should have that. You know, right after Trump got elected, he hosted a meeting of basically like every building trades leader in the mm -hmm. country at the White House to try to, you know, talk about their priorities and all that. And unbelievably, in the eight years of the Obama presidency, they never called a meeting like that, mm -hmm. never like reached out or tried to court labor, mm -hmm. you know, kind of just took it for granted. And I think mm -hmm. that that's very telling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I guess to follow up on that, um, you know, uh, so obviously Trump was like a disaster for workers. We've we've said that, you know, many times on the show before. Um, but I think what a lot of people kind of, especially especially like right after he won in 2016, a lot of people were really concerned about the fact that he had gotten something like what, like 43% of the union household vote. Now, obviously, you know, as, as you say, that wasn't really approaching Nixon levels, um, but I think it was more, uh, it, it was more than people had expected. And at least from what I could see, there were kind of two reactions um, among liberals and leftists to that. So I think among lots of people on the left, the reaction was like, oh my God, like this is like this is a huge problem for the Democrats. And and like I think actually Bernie Sanders went on TV after the election and he was like, I'm deeply ashamed of the Democrats. Like I'm ashamed that they lost this portion of the union vote. I'm ashamed that they lost a portion of the white working class, which is, you know, the people that I come from. Um, and like I agree, you know, like I think that that speaks ill of the Democrats, the fact that right. Trump got 43% of the union household votes. However, there was also a different reaction, uh, you know, on the part of liberals and some leftists where that number was evidence that were that these union members were somehow reactionary or that they had some were somehow clinging to some kind of cultural conservatism. Uh, and that this number spoke ill of them rather than the Democratic Party. Um, and, you know, I, I, I guess just in, in my opinion, like that, that sentiment kind of bubbles up from time to time to time, you know, like, I don't know if you've seen it mm -hmm. much, but. 
Um, yeah. Yeah. And I think, I mean, part of this, I think, is uh, kind of a misunderstanding on what Trump tended to focus on in his rallies. Now, that yeah. rally was after he won. But, you know, often if you would watch, I understand why people wouldn't want to watch a whole Trump <laughs> rally. But, you know, I was sometimes surprised at the ratio of like xenophobia, racist, sexist comments was actually pretty small sometimes. And especially mm -hmm. in a crowd like that, he would really emphasize the jobs part um, a lot. And again, it's like if it's between someone that's doing that and someone like um, Clinton, who was not doing much of it at all, mm -hmm. you know, um, it, it becomes hard to parse why exactly workers are voting for Trump, um, mm -hmm. how much of it is due to the bad stuff, how much of it is due to thinking he was pro worker, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's hard to parse that exactly. I just want to quickly shout out, there's a really good Christian Parenti essay, which I think is in Jacobin, um, about this very phenomenon. Like he sat down and listened to like a bunch of Trump speeches and he came away with the same interpretation. You know, there was a little bit of like, oh, let's, like that, let's build the wall, you know, but most of it was actually about uh, trade. Um, it was about, you know, withdrawing troops uh, from overseas. Uh, yeah. It was about protecting social security and Medicare. I mean, that's like, that's kind of, it, I mean, a lot of it sounded actually very similar to, you know, oh, this is it. Yeah, it's, it's really good. Definitely everybody check it out. Um, but again, it sounded actually very similar to a lot of what Bernie was talking about. And there were times when Trump would say things like, oh, like crazy Bernie, like, you know, he's actually right on some things, you know? And I think that was, right. as you were saying, a very calculated ploy to kind of um, make his platform seem like more worker friendly than it actually was. Right. And yeah, it's like, thank God Trump is lazy. Nixon wasn't <laughs> right, lazy. Right. And that's, I mean, I don't know how much longer we have before someone more competent comes mm -hmm. along that can kind of have a more sophisticated, sophisticated right. strategy. Yeah. So, I mean, that's the second thing I wanted to say. Like, you know, your... You're, you argue, I think rightly, that the left really has to try to win the building traits. Um, and I think, and, and you know, has to try to win blue collar and industrial workers. Um, and and I think for a lot of us, that's not controversial, but you know, you, you do hear, I think um, sometimes, especially again, like mostly liberals, but some leftists as well, um, will tend to act like manufacturing and the industrial trades are like relics of a bygone era or like those jobs are disappearing. So we need to reorient around the new working class, which is, you know, service work and healthcare. And obviously those are huge and growing sectors um, and they, they should be unionized and the left should definitely be fighting for those sectors as well. Um, but I think that argument at its worst is like a kind of demographic destiny type argument, or maybe we should call it like occupational destiny, right? Like, yeah. first of all, I don't actually think that manufacturing is as dead as some people make it seem. I mean, just today, Biden released a huge $2 trillion infrastructure plan. Like those are, those are you know, industrial and uh, manufacturing and construction jobs, some of them. Um, and and right. yeah, I mean, I... I I don't know. What are your thoughts? Yeah. And I think, I mean, we should distinguish a little bit between manufacturing and construction. And what I mean by that, right. you know, it's one thing making cars or, you know, the hospitals and the schools and all that are still going to have to get built, you know? And mm -hmm. I think, you know, so that kind of construction work, I think is always going to be happening. And, you know, we still have a decent amount of manufacturing. A lot of it is automated. Um, you know, they're just producing more with less workers um, mm -hmm. and more automation. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's silly to kind of like dismiss that. And also, you know, it's like, yes, the sad reality is that in many places, the industrial right. sector is hollowed out and being replaced with other sectors. It's not necessarily inevitable. I think mm -hmm. a country like the United States could embark on a federal jobs program that revived manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Obviously hard to do that if the left is not in power, but yeah, I don't think it's this inevitable thing that we'll, we'll no longer have manufacturing in, in, in any capacity. I guess I'm also kind of, you know, worried that if Democrats and like even parts of the left kind of lean into that message, you're just creating a vacuum for, as you were saying, a Nixon like figure to try to come in and capitalize on whatever culture war he could gin up. Right. So. Right. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Um, well, should we let's bring on our guest? Let's do it. Um, all right. So we have. Mark Dudzik here to talk about the Labor Party. Mark is the natural, national coordinator of the Labor Campaign for Single Payer. 
He's the former national organizer organizer for the Labor Party and the former president of Local 8, 149 of the Oil, Chemical, and Atomic Workers. Thanks for coming, Mark. Yeah, great to be here. Um, so maybe I'll start out with this. Can you talk a little bit more about your union, the Oil, Chemical, and Atomic Workers um, that you came out of? And you know what factors do you think made it the union, the place where the Labor Party idea was born? Yeah, well, I mean, this was, you know, it's a core industrial union. Uh, it's now part of the steel workers, um, but um, it represents oil refinery workers, chemical workers, and a bunch of uh, related industrial workers. Um, and, you know, it comes out of the uh, the CIO side of the, the labor movement coming out of the uh, 1940s and kept a lot of the characteristics of... Uh, of the CIO in terms of you know a, a real militant approach to trade unionism, a real focus on internal um, membership participation and mobilization, um, and you know was in battle with uh, some of the biggest uh, corporations in the history of capitalism, and they you know it, particularly the oil industry never really accepted trade unionism in the way that auto did and steel and a lot of the other core industry. So there was never that moment in the 1950s where we became junior partners with our employers. Um, you know, we never even won um, uh, a union union shop language in most of the uh, big oil companies uh, uh, until the early years of the 21st century. Uh, so there was a militant tradition that kind of guided what we were doing. And we got hit hard in the 1980s with the rise of neoliberalism and the corresponding deindustrialization and all of the attacks on labor. Um, and so um, we were really uh, ready to really begin to think about what was causing these things and what we needed to do to, to build political power for, for working people. Uh, we also had come out of a, a real tough fight uh, in the early 70s uh, for occupational health and safety that kind of created um, uh, a culture in the union that was very willing to think very expansively about, um, you know, who we need to bring into the into our fights in order to build the power that we need to take on these these enemies. And I think that also kind of led to this uh, uh, understanding. And we, had, you know, finally there, you know, we were privileged to have some really visionary leaders in our union, particularly a guy named Tony Mizaki, who I was so lucky to have uh, met and worked with very closely. Uh, he came out of the same local union that I was a member of. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, he really helped uh, uh, lead uh, a transformative process in our union that resulted in us uh, leading an effort to build a labor-based political party in the 1990s. So I want to jump in and ask if you could explain what the difference is between a labor party and other political parties. And when I say other political parties, I think I'm I'm thinking specifically of, you know, the third parties that have been around kind of forever throughout American history. Um, I know, you know, uh, uh, there's been a little bit of cross pollination between the Labor Party and the Green Party. I think I read that Ralph Nader came and spoke at the 1996 founding convention. Um, mm -hmm. But what is the difference between the Labor Party and some of these other political political parties. Yeah, well, I mean, when you say the Labor Party, I mean, I can only speak to the Labor Party that we were trying to build in the 90s and the early 2000s. Um, and, you know, our understanding was that, you know, politics needed to be you know, rooted, you know, in real, as uh, you, you all were discussing earlier in the call, in real working class constituencies that it had to have a real uh, a base that it, it, rather than just sort of an abstract um, program that might relate uh, to certain working class issues. It really had to come out of and be accountable to real constituencies. Um, and that in fact, those constituencies did not were not fully formed and that the first task of party building then had to be to, to build uh, those constituencies by having really deep, conversations with workers 
and with the institutions that represent workers, particularly unions, about what politics ought to look like if it was conducted on behalf of the great majority of people in this country who work for a living or who would need to work for a living in order to survive. Um, and, you know, that's very different from sort of the, the idea um, that you were talking about, if we build it, they will come, or, you know, we used to call it building the ark, you know, and just waiting for the flood. Um, you know, this idea that if you come up with the perfect program or the perfect uh, letterhead that somehow um, working people will flock to your party. Or, or then, you know, the other thing that I see in a lot of these third party efforts is it's more sort of like a reflecting a lifestyle choice or a branding or something. It's like, you know, people want to bear witness rather than actually create political change. Uh, there's no no sense of how to build power. It's all about, well, I, you know, I'm going to vote for the Green Party because I don't want to be tainted. You know, it's like I'm, I'm going to wear fair trade clothes so I can show the world that, you know, I don't believe in the exploitation of uh, child labor. But, you know, you're not really affecting the conditions that give rise to those problems. You're just bearing witness yourself. Uh, and that's a real problem with uh, with a lot of these these uh, parties. They're really, I think, tend to be very, uh, what did they call uh, Bhaskar self-indulgent? Uh, you know. <laughs> yeah, <think> that's... <laughs> <laughs> there's something to be said for that, you know, so... Um, what kind of factors do people need to take into account before thinking about embarking on something like this? And like, what factors were present that made people think in the nineties that this could actually go somewhere? Yeah, well, that that's a really good question, Paul. Um, I, th I think what, you know, what we saw in the nineties was um, we experienced 12 years of, you know, of, of the rise of neoliberalism, you know, the, the, uh, two Reagan administrations and George W. Bush, uh, or George Bush the first, um, you know, sort of consolidated neoliberalism. It was a real shock to the to the labor movement um, and uh, many other social movements. Um, you know, it took labor probably ten years to figure out that there had really been a permanent realignment of uh, power and class forces um, that. The Reagan Reaganism represented, and so we, you know, we experienced this very viscerally. It was a, you know, time of union busting, massive deindustrialization, um, you know, the attacks on uh, poor people, um, and then we, you know, nineteen come comes nineteen ninety two. Um, we, you know, the sort of pro working class folks elected Bill Clinton president. And, you know, this was, there was a real anticipation that maybe we could begin to turn things around uh, as a result of that. Um, and then what happened instead is that we, the working class, um, got the NAFTA agreement, with, which institutionalized um, um, the, the sort of new global trade regime. Um, we got uh, so-called welfare reform, which, um, eliminated the right of uh, of folks to a basic living um, said we no longer had that right um, and all of the other things that uh, the uh, Clintons gave us uh, we got failed health care reform um, um, the rise of mass incarceration all of these dynamics have sort of emerged as Clinton embraced a neoliberal neoliberal policy. So uh, that created a huge amount of ferment uh, within the labor movement. Um, and it uh, resulted in a real push for change. And, you know, the labor party movement was part of that. You know, we launched labor party advocates in, I'm thinking 1991, 92. Um, but, you know, there was also a real challenge for the, you know, the leadership of the AFL-CIO. Uh, there was a successful challenge in the Teamsters Union. Uh, we had a, a uh, insurgent uh, candidacy with, uh, led by Kerry that won in the Teamsters Union. Um, we challenged and won. Uh, Sweeney won the presidency of the AFL-CIO, and his program was to sort of uh, adopt a more militant uh, approach, 
more confrontational approach to uh, trade unionism and to focus on organizing. And, you know, we laid out a program that was going to organize a million new workers a year uh, into the union. Uh, obviously, it didn't work out, but, you know, there, there, this was a moment, a brief moment of upsurge uh, in the working class movement. And, you know, within that context, you know, the idea was that a uh, working class movement that's on the move, that's organizing a million workers a year, is going to have the kind of momentum and dynamism that could actually uh, develop uh, a movement of independent working class politics that could really break with the Democratic Party and launch a party of our own. And so that was sort of the motion that uh, brought us to this Labor Party moment uh, in the mid 1990s. And so as it was getting started, the uh, Labor Party advocates, which unions became bought into the idea of a Labor Party and supported it? And what do you think it was about those unions that made them more receptive? Yeah, well, the um, this th there were a whole lot more unionized industrial workers in the 90s than there are today. Um, and a lot of the momentum for the Labor Party came out of those unions. Um, because that was sort of the tip of the spear in terms of experiencing neoliberalism. Um, and so, you know, there was a number of industrial unions, large locals, uh, um, and other sectors that were really uh, at, at the core of the Labor Party movement. Um, and, and then some, some elements of new, new unionism, um, the uh, California nurses had just experienced an insurgency that had transformed that union that which had been sort of a professional association transformed it into a real fighting union and they embraced the vision of a labor party and uh, uh, some of the uh, organizing uh, new organizing in uh, SEIU and some other things locals came together around this issue um, but a lot of the you know the public sector and service, unions were not um, as involved in it back then as they would probably tend to be today because of the different ec uh, economic dynamics that took place in the in the meantime. So I, I want to dive in and, and ask you about um, uh, some of the internal workings of the Labor Party. Um, so you had written at one point, um, let me find the quote, um, you wrote the, in the 90s, the Labor Party, quote, avoided the expediency of identity politics and liberal talking points and instead organized around broad class-based interests and concerns. Mm -hmm. uh, and that statement like really struck me because like it sounds a lot like what Whoa. Bernie Sanders tried to do, right? Like that was a huge part of his project and um, I guess what got me thinking is a lot of people tried to use that tactic against him. Like a lot of the Democratic Party elite, uh, you know, would, would come out and say things like, well, you're not focusing enough on, you know, what we might call identity politics or, you know, your your universal programs are uh, somehow, you know, uh, like incomplete or racist or something because, you know, they don't give enough uh, weight to you know, identity concerns. Um, so I guess my question for you is, how were you able to kind of navigate those issues in the 90s um, and avoid, as you say, the expediency of these liberal talking points um, and, and identity politics? And do you have any thoughts on how we might continue that project now? Yeah, well, by the way, Bernie appropriated our whole program. So, uh, you know, including free higher ed, which we spent a lot of yeah. time developing. And, um, and if, you know, uh, Adolf Reed was central to to mm -hmm. that campaign. So, um, goddamn so, sectarian Bernie. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that whole thing, I mean, you know, we organized on the right to a job. Mm -hmm. We called it just health care. You know, Medicare mm -hmm. for all, mm -hmm. free higher education, the, mm -hmm. the right to organize, family leave. Um, you know, these were these were core issues that uh, moved working people in. And you know, I, look, I I think just like Bernie, I think we basically kept our eye on the prize and organized uh, around the issues that brought working people to the table and brought put pulled together a multiracial working class movement. I mean, these are issues that, um, you know, um, will, will build work, build the unity and the power that we need in order to win victories for all working people. 
Um, and so that was that was always the, um, uh, the the central focus of what we did. And you know, people had many other issues and concerns, and you know, we tried to create just like you do in a union hall or a union organizing drive. You you respect and give allow people to give voice to those issues and concerns. But you you know you you focus on you know the issues that you can focus on and that you can make make progress on. You know and um, you know, other things you just have to put aside for another day until you build the kind of unity and power that you can achieve it. Um, so, you know, I mean, I remember we had this big debate once about uh, Nixon was bombing Serbia. Um, there's a big crisis with uh, 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 Albanian autonomy and, it, you know, it's a whole, a whole mess uh, in Serbia. And, you know, people were like, we got to take a position. We've got to take a stand on this issue of the bombing of Serbia. And, you know, it was like, you know, I said at one point that whatever position we take will have actually absolutely no impact on the policy of bombing Serbia because we have no power to influence that policy. So let's talk about what, what it will take to build the power so that we can weigh in on things like that. And that's really the, the idea of party building is you build, you know, around the issues that will unify and build power, not around the issues that will, you know, be sort of uh, boutique issues that satisfy uh, various constituencies. And uh, can you talk about the um, the corporate power in the American Dream education program and the other kind of issue-based campaigns the, the Labor Party ran? Um, yeah, sure. So we worked with a group called the Labor Institute um, who had, you know, specialized, still specializes in, you know, a model of worker centered uh, education and we developed a, a training program called corporate power in the American dream which you know basically you know gave workers the tools to sort of understand how capitalism works um, and how we can build some alternatives to it and we didn't put it quite in those terms back in the in the 90s uh, but we used this program and we rolled it out and the idea was to get local unions and labor federations to sponsor these these trainings it was a day-long training program and you know thousands of workers went through this program and it kind of helped to create sort of a common a common narrative and a common understanding about what we're doing and why we're doing it um, and then you know we did you know we tried to connect that work to the sort of issue or organizing work and agitational work around these issues of you know, uh, of jobs and health care and education and uh, um, family leave and, uh, you know, all of the other issues that uh, a working class program ought to connect with. So I want to I want to fast forward a little bit um, to ask you about the possibilities, I guess, for kind of restarting or thinking again about uh, something similar to the Labor Party now. Um, I know that in 2012, you wrote a kind of postmortem with Catherine Isaac about, you know, the uh, kind of rise and fall of the Labor Party uh, with some lessons and challenges for the future. And you had mentioned in uh, that piece that, you know, again, back in 2012, this is not the right time to restart the Labor Party. Um, there's work that we can be doing, but we obviously can't have a Labor Party without a labor movement. Uh, and at that time, the labor movement, um, you know, was was so weakened and so under attack that it just didn't seem like a feasible project. Um, now, you know, I don't think that that much has changed since 2012. However, I will say that there have been a few events um, I'm thinking here of, of course, the two Bernie Sanders campaigns um, and then the kind of wave of strikes in 2018, most notably the teacher strikes. Um, I don't, of, of course, I don't think that means that the labor movement is completely back on its feet by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but I'm wondering what you think of those developments and whether that changes any of the assessments you made in 2012. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there has been some, some real changes. Um, I think I, and I can't speak for my colleague who I wrote that article with, but I think I, to some degree, underestimated the ability uh, to use uh, a class-oriented election, electoral challenge to pull together a, a labor, uh, labor-based program. I think Bernie did that masterfully. 
um, and particularly in 2016. Um, and, you know, and, and he, it got such a response because there is so much uh, uh, anger about, you know, the uh, inequality and the power of capital and uh, its impact on people's lives uh, and the, the failure of the democratic establishment uh, uh, to address those issues in any coherent way. So, you know, there, there are, you know, I think there's more opportunities to talk about independent working class politics um, today than there was in 2012. Um, I think the labor movement has a long way to go before we could talk ab ab about it being a resurgent labor movement. Um, but you know that there, these things could happen very quickly in the same way that, you know, Bernie Sanders vision took hold uh, and motivated millions of people. I think, you know, there, you know, we, you know, there are a lot of signs out there that say that, you know, working people, um, both inside and outside unions are, you know, in, in a place where, um, you know, if the right combination of uh, internal and external events come together, you know, there could be a real uh, momentum to, towards a resurgent labor movement. And then, you know, then everything's off the table. Then we have to look at, you know, what's possible and, you know, how we're going to do it. I don't think um, we want to be formulaic uh, on exactly how the next uh, the next push towards working class politics plays out in the US you know there's all kinds of unique challenges and problems um, in the political system um, but you know that you know the goal has got to be to construct an independent working class politics and use that as a, a basis to build a real um, organization that has a real constituency um, and is really connected to the felt concerns of working people. So in, in I guess, the ashes of the 2016 Bernie campaign, um, there were uh, several you know people who had worked on his campaign and surrogates who started getting the ball rolling on this idea for a third party. Um, I, think, I think they called it the People's Party. Um, there was a movement uh, in 2016 to draft Bernie to that party after he had you know, sort of dropped out of the race. Um, and, and that movement is still going forward. Um, I, I, I believe they just had a big convention last year. Um, Cornell West, Nina Turner, um, and some other people like Chris Hedges were there and they spoke. Um, and so, and you know, this was obviously born out of, as we've been talking about, this very deep dissatisfaction with the Democratic Party, especially after the, the Democratic Party elite uh, sabotaged Bernie, you know, in many ways during the primaries. And this is not a labor party um, insofar as, you know, from what I can tell, it it um, it hasn't really started with unions the way that, you know, the 1996 Labor Party did, um, but is instead looking to sort of reach across a couple different organizations. Um, and I think they say on their website that, you know, unions will be part of that process at some point. Um, but I'm wondering if you have any thoughts um, either just on this this particular uh, project, if you know much about it, or just on the feasibility of an independent working class, you know, um, um, organ, as you say, that is kind of combination, you know, labor and I guess you could say like, advocacy groups, um, especially given that union density in the U.S. is still so low. Yeah, I mean, I'm not intimately uh, connected with that process, but I don't think it's built the kind of momentum at this point that can kind of break out. Uh, you know, it looks like it's the usual suspects who have signed on. Um, and um, again, I don't think that there's a understanding of how you need to build and organize a constituency, uh, you know, as a fundamental precondition. Um, there's labor is not at the table. Um, and, you know, I think we've came to the conclusion that you labor and, you know, other social movements have to be at the table from the beginning um, or else they're never going to come to the table. You know, mm -hmm. they have to be part of the process that builds these things. And if, you know, if, if they're not ready to come to the table, then we have to create the conditions that'll bring them to the table, not just go ahead and set the table without them. Mm -hmm. um, and that's sort of where we are in in politics right now. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that these things have to happen. 
you know, the stakes in politics, you know, moving through the Trump administration, Trump years were very high and the ability to think of any kind of a spoiler type party um, in that moment um, was, you know, almost impossible. Anybody who was connected to the real world and real organizing, um, you know, would have just shuddered at the thought that, you know, anything that that we could do, any, anything that we did that would increase the chances that Trump regime would stay in power um, was just anathema to most, most organizers and activists. Mm -hmm. So now, you know, we see what the, the next few years bring to this, uh, to this moment, you know, um, that's, you know, can the Biden administration co-opt some of this energy around working class concerns and working class politics and co-opt co enough of it to keep, uh, you know, the Democratic Party in the game. Uh, you know, I don't know. I don't think so, ultimately. But, you know, I don't know if you measure that in in months and years or in decades at this mm -hmm. point. So I, uh, I I have a kind of related follow up to that. Um, and that's, you know, uh, for, for people who are readers of Jacobin or familiar with the work in Jacobin, uh, lots of Jacobin writers kind of try to get at this question from time to time. Um, I'm thinking here of Seth Ackerman, who has a great mm. piece uh, called A Blueprint for a New Party, um, where he, he basically advocates starting, a, I, I'm, I'm like paraphrasing his article a lot. Um, I encourage everyone to read it, but he advocates starting, you know, a working class party, um, something that very much resembles the 1996 Labor Party, except uh, with, with the exception that we should not be pursuing the ballot line because his argument is that, you know, it's just, it differs from state to state. It's so difficult to try to win it. Um, and it just, it's just a huge time suck. Um, and I know that that was something that, uh, you know, the Labor Party um, also debated or also was thinking about um, at the time. And the Labor Party was successful in getting the ballot line in South Carolina. Um, but I'm wondering what you think of that strategy and whether pursuing a ballot line um, is is uh, something that, you know, the left should continually do or if it's a little premature. Yeah, look, I thought Seth's article was really interesting and really grappled with, you know, the realities of the the constructed political system in the US. Um, so, you know, I think there's really interesting ideas. I think the only thing I would say that would be critical is that I think it's getting a little bit ahead of ourselves um, to, you know, think exactly what, what that party and that movement is gonna look like. Um, but, you know, I, I think it, it's actually useful when you talk to, uh, you know, people who are engaged in politics, trade unionists and other social movement folks, and they say, well, how are we going to do this? And, you know, aren't we going to open up the, the floodgates to, you know, a right wing resurgence and stuff, you know, to talk with you, some of the con concepts that Seth uh, explored in that article to talk, talk through that. Um, but, you know, really the, 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 the real problem and the real challenge is let's build the freaking constituency that can build a party and they'll figure out how we how we move it forward, um, you know, and how we gain a political voice. Um, but you know, again, it's not we're not going to build the party over you know sort of structural proposals about how to use the um, you know electoral system. We're going to build the party around you know a demand for working class politics, and then we and then you know we need the technical stuff follows the. Uh, 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 political uh, stuff. Yeah, that that uh that just reminds me. Since we were talking about Nader earlier, um, I wanted to briefly mention that uh, uh at least in two thousand, and I, I think this has happened several times since then. There's a lot of talk of vote swapping. So, like people in you know safe states were encouraged to swap their vote. Uh, for, you know, uh, uh, Kerry or uh, Gore, whoever, with somebody in a swing state uh, who wanted to vote for Nader. Um, and, and that's an example of, I think, the kind of like technical hack that a lot of people uh, want to bring forth to try to break or, you know, uh, hack the two party system somehow. And it didn't work then and it doesn't work now. Yeah. Um, I, in, in, I think this happened again in 2016. And because it's, you know, the digital age, lots of people were like, we have an app for this. Um, but neither to say we we know how that turned out 
you, you know, what can I say? I mean, it's just so, you know, maybe you feel good about that Nader got more votes, but, you know, where does it, where does it go? And look, I think Ralph Nader has done a lot of, you know, uh, has really pointed out a lot of the contradictions in the system and it's, mm -hmm you know, been very consistent and did not lose the 2000 election mm -hmm. for Gore and all of that shit. But right. you know, it's like, what's, you know, what, ha where, where are you left when all of that happens when you do, you know, let's say you develop the perfect app and every, every uh, Pennsylvania voter who wanted to vote for Ralph got a New York voter to vote for him, it, you know, so what? So we got 100,000 New York votes for Ralph Nader. Mm -hmm. Where have we changed the fundamental uh, dynamics of the political system? Mm -hmm. And I can say that no one in Philly is going to try and help out a New Yorker through an app. So, <laughs> so we can count out Pennsylvania as a swing state swap. <laughs> All right. right. <laughs> Find your own swing state. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, oh, go ahead, Jen. Um, I, so I, I, I was just going to, um, I, I want to talk a little bit about the, I guess, downfall of the Labor Party, um, which, you know, you, 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 as I say, you've written about with Catherine Isaac. Um, and one of the elements that you point out there is that the industrial unions that were kind of the core base of the Labor Party um, uh, experienced a lot of erosion uh, at mm -hmm. the end of the 90s. Um, and, you know, so I'm wondering it if we're thinking seriously about trying to not just revitalize the labor movement, but also, you know, thinking about how we can start laying the groundwork for a possible future labor party, which sectors should we be looking at? Which sectors are strategic? Um, and, you know, which would kind of be ripe for in it, for inclusion in a new labor party? Yeah. You know, I, I do think that, we have to build, think about how to build the party on more than just a union base. Mm -hmm. I think in the era, in the mid nineties, you could still talk, uh, you know, even then it was, you know, we needed to begin to address that issue, but you could still talk about unions um, as having a much more central um, uh, representation of working class Americans than they do today. So, you know, we, we have to begin to look out of the box and, you know, there's a lot of uh, social movements around economic justice and social justice that have emerged. Um, a lot of models that have emerged around worker centers and uh, um, immigrant organizing and things that, you know, you could, you can begin to build on that experience and think about some broader uh, constituencies. Um, but, you know, nonetheless, the, the institutional labor movement you know, is the only real social movement that's funded exclusively by working class people and still has the, the substantial resources and organizing capacity that nobody else has. Uh, so they still need to be at the center of this, of this party. And, and you know, I, I guess you, you would look at where the motion is within uh, the labor movement. And, you know, the, you know, education workers are certainly Central to that motion right now, the attacks on the public sector that uh, have occurred and that will probably begin to occur again as we move more towards austerity. You know, we'll call call out uh, um, a reaction. You know, I'm really impressed with uh, um, the the fight that led by the postal unions, particularly American Postal Workers Union. You know, against the privatization of the post office and how they framed that in much broader terms, in terms of public goods. Um, so, you know, a lot of those sections of the labor movement will come together. And I, I do think that there's, there could very well be an explosion in, in organizing in the logistics sector and some related sectors that might really be the, be the force that really drives the labor movement into a resurgence. Um, so, uh, you know, I don't know about the, uh, Bessemer, Alabama, Amazon election, but there, there's something, something is going to begin to come together, particularly in logistics and those related industries that I think will drive a real dynamism throughout the labor movement. And so since the labor party folded, you've been mostly or, or very active with the labor campaign for single payer. We, we don't say we folded. We say we put it on the shelf. Put on the shelf, <laughs> right. I mean, you can fold and go on a shelf. Okay. But, uh, 
Um, so you, you know, you've been active with the labor campaign for single payer, and specifically recently um, campaigning around the Healthcare Emergency Guarantee Act. I've been on a few Zoom calls with you about that. Um, can you just talk about that work and why do you think that's an important thing to be doing right now? Yeah, well, you know, I mean, it, it sort of came out of some of the organizing we were doing in the Labor Party, as well as other unionists who were organizing from uh, from other perspectives. But you know, it's it's like this single issue, I think, that um, um, height show, it shows all of the sort of contradictions of capitalism that workers have to live under. Uh, it's a single winnable reform that, you know, could really make massive improvements in the security of, you know, almost every working class American. You know the, how precarious their access to health care is. Everybody knows that they're, you know, one a job away from losing their health care and a major illness from bankruptcy under this system. And it's just driving massive insecurity. So it's, it's you know, it's to me, it's sort of like if you want to talk about building a politics of labor and building a revitalized labor movement, um, Medicare for all is central to that project. Um, so, uh, you know, we've been really, uh, working on it in, in that direction. We really saw the opportunity, you know, as the pandemic hit and, you know, tens of millions of workers lost their jobs and their access to healthcare. You know, we really saw that there could have been a, a political opportunity, uh, to pass an emergency version of, uh, a sloppy emergency version of Medicare for all that said, basically, uh, we'll pay all your medical bills. Uh, if you have insurance, they have to continue to pay their portion and we'll pay the rest. If you lost your job, you don't have insurance, send the bills to Medicare and we'll pay it for the duration of the crisis. Would have been a simple uh, solution. Um, it didn't make it through the uh, the last round of bailout legislation. Uh, there's still some discussion about how to how to wrap it into some some of these subsequent rounds, but those those are the kind of issues I think that can really, you know, pull together you know broad constituencies. Uh, the work, uh, Paul, that you and others have done in the Philadelphia area, where you got, I don't know, 30, 30 plus Philly unions, ma a major portion of the Philadelphia labor movement, to sign on to a call for uh, to support the Emergency Guarantee Act and and to pressure three key Congress people on that, I think is a model for how we see uh, moving these kind of issues in the in the broader labor movement. All right. Well, thanks for the Philly shout out. Um, but uh, I think that's all the that questions we have. Uh, thank you so much, Mark, for for coming on. Um, people should check out that article that was mentioned. There's also an interview in Jacobin um, about these issues. Um, so thanks again, Mark, for coming on. Uh, great to be here. A wonderful discussion. So, Thank you, Mark. See ya. Um, and so we're not done with the guests yet. We have someone else lined up. Um, the everyone's favorite future presidential candidate, <laughs> the uh, best union leader uh -huh. on this side or the other Welcome, side. Welcome, Mr. President. Of the Mississippi. Uh. <laughs> Don't forget that. Um, the hashtag run Richard run um, <laughs> hashtag run Richard run uh, Richard Hooker from Teams is local six twenty three. What's up? How y'all doing? Good. Welcome back, Richard. Um, since thank you're you, wearing you your jacket, I just want to mention I saw a, a really great article the other day that uh, proposed that if every union member were to get a cool bomber jacket, union density that. would skyrocket. Yeah, I'm sure yeah. like fifty thousand people said that to you. <laughs> anyway, yeah, thoughts. I saw that. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, listen, whatever we got to do to get people into the union, I'm, I'm in for it. If we right. got to give them jackets, uh, right. whatever, whatever we need to do. For sure. <laughs> and for people who don't know, you know, uh, Richard's uh, secretary treasurer of Teams is Local 623. They represent um, UPS workers and workers at Greyhound in Philadelphia. Um, so we thought it'd be great to bring you on because, you know, we, we re recently did a picket last Friday um, at UPS, one of the headquarters in Philadelphia. Um, you're seeing some pictures of it now. I love the fat cat, never gets old. Um, oh, so yeah. could you just uh, say a little bit about, you know, what, what's been going on at UPS and why did you organize this rally? Well, UPS has a history of, of just unsafe workplace measures. They, they talk about safety. They talk about all these things. And it sounds good. But when it happens, 
um, the truth always comes out. I mean, there's a lot of stories out there where members can tell you how UPS handled them when they were injured on the job. Um, some of them are afraid to, to report an injury because of fear of retaliation. And, you know, who wants to get hurt and then be retaliated against by the employer? You know, it's not your fault you got hurt. You know, things happen, you get hurt, you want to be taken care of, and you don't want to be mistreated. You don't want to be disregarded. But constantly, these things happen at UPS. So this is just one of many instances that UPS, they try to sweep under the rug. They don't want it to come out. Uh, and Paul, you were there. You know, these guys were standing on the side of the street. They were hiding up in the, the office windows, you know, because they know we're telling the truth. And this continues to happen. And, and, I, and what I hope is that, you know, not just here at 623, but I think th these types of actions, especially when it comes to workplace safety and how they treat our members when an injury does occur, I think every local in, in this country needs to have these type of rallies to show solidarity that, you know, it's really one, you know, one injury is, is to all. Injury to one is an injury to all. You know, I think we need to really participate in what that really means. Right. And, oh, go ahead, Jen. Um, I was just going to ask, so, you know, the pandemic is still going on. And throughout the pandemic, we've heard a lot of talk from everybody, from, you know, politicians, from commentators, from from activists, from celebrities about how important essential workers are. So I go around my neighborhood in New York and I see all these signs that are like, thank you, you know, UPS. Thank you, you know, uh, USPS, FedEx, like doctors, you know, grocery workers. Um, there seems to be a lot of public support for essential workers right now. And I'm wondering if you're seeing any of that translate into a difference in your working conditions or if UPS management, you're already shaking your head. I was going to ask if UPS no. management feels like they no. have more pressure. No. Okay. So say more about that. Yeah. UPS, listen, um, UPS doesn't care about what the public has to say about um, essential workers. I mean, they don't even care. You know, they don't care. All they care is is, is the packages move to point A and to, to point B and how they can get them there faster. If, they, if you know, if it has... If it's on the back of the member, they don't care. They don't care if you're sick. They say they care. Um, stay home and all these kinds of things. And, and again, it sounds good to the public because what I've noticed is what's going to happen is UPS will change the narrative and they'll say, hey, we're doing all these great things. We're providing uh, PPE. We're providing uh, two weeks of COVID pay. We're doing all these great things and that's good. But what they don't tell you is, hey, listen, um, we also are forcing our people to come in on an unscheduled work day. And if they can't come in, we're going to discipline them for it. I done gave you almost 60 weeks, 60 hours, 60 hard hours to, to make you more profitable. And now if I can't give you any more, you want to take my job away from me. And that's the story that doesn't get out there. Mm -hmm. It's easy for them to say, hey, man, we're doing this. And, it, and it's all fine and good because that's what they're supposed to do. These guys make billions of dollars. But what we don't want done is, okay, if a person can't come in on an unscheduled day and they got things planned, they don't want to get retaliated or disciplined because they have a life outside of UPS. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's that and that's the message that to me, that also needs to be exalted out there so people to see. It's not just about, you know. Um, you know, UPS make it all, you know, they, 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 they provided all this PPE, which we had to fight for, Paul. You remember all that. We had to go a, a year ago, pretty much to this week. We had to go to the news. We had to go to the papers just to get them to do the right thing again for our members. UPS is not going to do the right thing on their own. Mm -hmm. You have to force them to do it. You got to bring the fat cat out. You got to bring the news out there. You got to bring city council. You got to bring state reps because... They're not going to do the right thing on their own. You have to force them. You have to, to pretty much expose the whole matter and not just the part that makes them look good. Because, there's a, again, I said it on the last show, there is a dark, dark place in UPS that people really need to know about. Mm -hmm. And there was, a, I mean, a specific incident with a member, with a woman um, who got injured. Do you mind talking about that a little bit? Just, you know, what, what kind of triggers so, some of this? So, again, I, I really want to put this out there. This happens 
all over the country. It's not just 623, it's not just Philly. Up and down the East Coast, West Coast, Midwest, the Plains, you name it. What I'm about to tell you happens in every, pretty much every UPS barn, every UPS city. Um, it happens in, in, in their location. So this is what happened. Back on February the, the, the 4th, we had a young lady who was working, and she fell, and she broke her wrist, and she broke two bones in her arm. What UPS decided to do was let her sit um, in pain. She was crying. Um, she wanted to get medical attention. Uh, the the frontline supervisors, or also known as the part time supervisors, they wanted to take her to get medical treatment. However, the upper management said, "No, you leave her there. You get back with the operation." And then we'll make sure she gets um, medical treatment at 7.30. This happened at almost 5 o'clock in the morning. So for two and a half hours, she had to sit and wait to get medical treatment. Because of this, she had to have emergency surgery on her wrist and two broken bones in her arm. Now, um, I, I, and check this out. They didn't give her union representation when this happened. Because they knew if the steward was there, then they would have been able to get that uh, our member some help. Because the steward for that ship, ship, ship is very, very good. He's not going to take no mess, and they know that. So they avoided him to try to hide it from him, let her sit there, and then look what happened. So she's in pain. She had to have emergency surgery. Um, so I immediately, when I found out, I got in contact with the labor division of our area and I said, Hey, what are we going to do about this? This can happen. Why did it happen? Who was the cause of it? So we did our investigation. Um, some supervisors reached out to us because they don't like what happened. The very first thing one of the, uh, full-time management team told uh, one of my business agents is if, if, if this was their daughter, they would have got you know, I'll remember some help. Hmm. And everybody knows that. If this was their family, if this was their spouse, their their daughter, their child, they would have gotten them some help. If, if it was a CEO, they would have flew the doctor in there. Right. right. Yeah. But, yeah. But when it comes to the working person, they care nothing about nothing. And, and they shows it. Mm hmm. Do you want to talk a little bit about who came out to that rally to support, like what people, organizations, unions were out there? So we had District Council 33 here in Philly. Uh, there's a public sector uh, union. Um, they, they came out. The, the president came out. Uh, Ernest Garrett, he came out. He's the president there. Uh, we had the, um, the secretary treasurer was asking me 810. Monica Robinson, she came out. We had state representative Malcolm Kenyatta. He was also a candidate for the U.S. Senate. He came out, State Representative Nakal Saval. He came out. We had um, Councilwoman Helen Gim. She came out from, you know, from Philly. Uh, we also had uh, Jed Dodd, which is the vice president of a section of the railroad division of the Teamsters. Uh, our shop stewards came out. We had Philippos, which, which uh, they did with safety measures and workplace. They came out. Um, it was just a good, good, good rally. Um, also, the labor managers from UPS, they came out, but they was on the other side of the right. street. <laughs> and, right. and, 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 and I, and I want to keep I want to keep focusing on that because while they were on the other side of the street and while the, 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 the regional president was up in her office and the, the, the president or I should say the, the head labor manager of our district was up in the office looking out to see what was happening. Um, they should have been out there, too, to give us some type of ex explanation on why did they let this member, our member, Salifa Burrell, out there in pain for all that long time. Because if it was them, their family, their loved one, their daughter, it would not happen. It wouldn't have happened. But for whatever reason, they prioritize packages over people, and it's a constant thing. And I'm hoping that everybody watching this um, share this. Talk to, you know, your, your, the people in your communities about this, because this is who UPS is. This is who they don't want you to know about. Yeah, they, they, they ship a lot of stuff and they do a lot of things, but it's all because of the worker. And this is how they treat the worker. 
Mm -hmm. All right. And then just the last question, um, you know, what kind of things do you have planned next? I'm partly asking so I can put stuff on my calendar, but uh, you know, okay. what, what are some next steps you, so you feel like? Or? I think what we need to do is have like a massive, massive, massive rally. Uh, every local in this country, because it happens in every local, every last one of them. Um, I was in our building last night talking to the members and they were telling me stories about when it happened, you know, to them when they got hurt and what the company tried to do. This goes on everywhere and UPS and their whole company, everywhere it happens. So what we're going to do, what I'm trying to organize now is a national uh, safety rally for just every UPS um, barn in the country. I reached out to a, a few people today. Um, and I, I want to get this done um, because you're going to have to have a massive action to, in order to beat UPS. Mm -hmm. One local can't do it alone. It has to be every local with the same same agenda, same message. It's not about politics. How can we stop UPS? Because I had a conversation with the president of our district yesterday, and the underlying message is this, Paul. This, this is the message. Hooker, we were wrong. We didn't do the right thing. We should have got a help, but I'm not going to allow you to dictate to me on moving um, the division manager because he made a, uh, a, a bad call. We know we were wrong, mm. but I would rather uh, pay the cop. I would rather pay her lawyer, pay whatever suit she got. I would rather pay millions of dollars before I let the union believe that they can win against us. Right. That's the underlying message. That's the message. It has nothing to do with Sanifa and getting her her what she wants. We cannot let the union win. That's what this is about. Right. And you know, it's the same with the schools. Like they want to push yeah. them in for like one month of instruction just to send the message that they can do it. You know. Yep. But uh thanks so much, Rich. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have. Um, but thanks for coming on. I'm sure you'll come Thank on you. again soon. You are audience favorite. Whenever, um oh yeah. Thank well, you. I appreciate Good luck. Yeah, I appreciate it. Whenever you guys get ready, Paul, you know, keep your phone because we get ready to yeah. hit this thing. Um, because we're right. not gonna stop. We're not. Mm -hmm. Um, she Sanifa deserves justice. Her her son deserves an answer. Uh, her local family deserves an answer, and we plan on giving her that answer. All right. So brother. you hear you heard it here first, everybody. National rally on the horizon. Right. Stay yes. tuned in your area. Oh yes. All right, Rich. Thanks so much. Thanks, Have Rich. Have a good one. All right. All right. So uh, we usually do Labor Paul now uh, for everybody who is just tuning in. Uh, Labor Paul is our Q&A advice column with none other than Paul, um, who answers, takes he takes questions uh, that come in from the last show and then he answers them. So if you've got a labor question, uh, pop it in the chat or in the comments and Paul will answer that question the next time he's on. Um, so I think, you know, since we had the UPS update from Rich, um, we're just going to do one question today. Yeah. Um, and let's see, that is, so someone on YouTube um, asks, I work for a pretty large international internet company making above minimum wage, but still not $24 an hour. Uh, this person's in the USA. We have good benefits, work from home and a fun culture. We have it okay. And I imagine there's a lot of ambivalence to unionizing. What do you think would be the main benefits of unionizing in this situation and how should it be approached? Yeah, this is a good question. I think there are many people out there where this situation applies, where, you know, you, you make a decent ish wage, your boss is cool, things aren't that bad. And I think the benefits of unionizing are that without a union, everything about the workplace is subject to change based on the whims of the management or those higher up in the corporate chain. So, you know, what happens if new management comes in? which is very common to happen at companies and changes the work culture. What if profit margins get smaller and all of a sudden they decide they need to be cut in pay or you need um, you all need to start paying more in your health benefits. These kinds of things happen all the time and only a union could provide some defense and stability against sudden changes in management or things they want to implement that are bad for workers. And of course, this is a harder argument to make, um, you know, it's easier to argue for a union if your boss is terrible, if you're paid minimum wage. But, you know, I would suggest try to tap into previous employment experience of your coworkers. I think there's a high chance that there is someone that has experienced a change in management at another company 
and understands that things can change for the worse pretty quickly. And it's important to be clear that the union isn't necessarily a personal attack on your immediate supervisor. And this comes up a lot in union drives. Let's say the manager is really nice and most workers like them. People will see the union as something personal against that manager. And that's really not necessarily the case. And so, um, and, and if that's the case in, in your workplace and workers are kind of raising that concern, try to preempt that by making clear that managers are often forced to do terrible things by people above them in the company. And they don't always have control over it. And so make the point that the union will protect against attacks from the highest levels of the company. It's not necessarily about a personal beef with the manager if you like your manager. And um, I'll end by saying that often people do have a lot of grievances, even if they don't, even if they say that their job is fine. Try asking open-ended questions. Um, you know, like, what do you think of the health insurance plan? Um, what do you think of the paid sick leave policy? Often, when you do that, you actually draw out grievances that people may not say if you just ask them, "How do you like your job?" Um, but again, I acknowledge this is a tougher sell in this kind of situation. So hopefully, some of those tips were helpful. I just want to quickly add, um, uh, I so I actually used to work a really cushy foundation job where we had like amazing benefits, like it was the, the working conditions were great. Like it was definitely like everybody clocked out like at five, like, you know, mm. on the dot. Um, and the health insurance in particular was like the Cadillac of health insurance. And we didn't have to pay a cent. Like the foundation just like covered it. It was like, you know, in the working world, that's like basically unheard of in the non-union working world. Right. That's, that's unheard of. Right. Um, so that, so for the duration of, you know, me working there, it was pretty much the same. I worked there for about five years and it was the same, like almost the whole time. But then like, so I had already like given my notice for like a different reason. So I was mm -hmm. out the, I was, you know, out the door anyway, but management suddenly decided that they were going to change up the healthcare program and, right. um, they were going to start requiring employee contributions and their justification was, this is the industry standard. So, you know, the healthcare had been really good before. And it was, like I say, it was unusual for a non-union workplace. Right. Um, but management, you know, looked around at what other sort of similar organizations were doing. And that was the justification they needed mm. to say, well, like you guys have it too good. So we're going to start doing this. And there isn't anything you can do about it, obviously, um, because, you know, this is just the industry standard. So I, I just mentioned you know, that that phrase industry standard, because right. I think another reason why unions are so important is that they raise the floor for everybody, not just for shop members. Um, but they, you know, I, I think they go a long way towards setting industry standards. So obviously, mm -hmm. in like the white collar foundation world, there aren't a ton of unions. Um, so it's easy to be like, well, the, the industry standard is down here. Um, so right. just just my two cents as someone who's been in that situation. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think, you know, it is harder, on, you know, a lot of times it does take direct experience for people to click but you know I think even tapping into maybe experiences of uh, family members um, of your co-workers I think most people that have been around working for a little bit and are a little older and experienced understand that that stuff can change and I think that's a good argument for you need a union even if right now it seems like things are great at mm -hmm. work yeah all right. Well, again, if any watchers have uh, labor poll questions, please go ahead and submit them either in the chat or in the comments, and we will get to them next time we're on. Um, I do want to mention on that note, we're off next week. So there will unfortunately be no Jacobin show. We're much like Paul, we're on spring break as well, I guess. <laughs> but we will see you the week after. All right. Bye, everyone. Good night, everyone.